All right, everyone. Um, it is 310, and so we're very happy to um, welcome you to Web Accessibility for ETD Submission, Implementing a New Standard. And I'd like you to welcome Terry Robinson. She is from the Mississippi State University Libraries, and Lara Three, who is from Mississippi State University College of Education. Um, I would just remind you to um, please leave your uh, video and audio off, and please enter any questions you have in the Q&A uh, for this session, and we will address them after the presentation. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Terry and Laura. Thank you. Um, I'm Lara, and uh, so today we're going to talk about web accessibility for ETDs and uh, creating those standards. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, university background. Then we're going to talk about our accessibility directive, setting standards, and then looking forward. So a little bit about Mississippi State. We are a land grant institution. We are made up of eight colleges with 45 departments that require a thesis or a dissertation. Um, there are seven interdisciplinary programs with four research and extension centers. Our enrollments for fall in 2020, um, total enrollment was almost 23,000. And then our graduate students, we had just over 3,800. So a little bit about our office. We are actually located in our university's library. So we're not located in the graduate school. We do have um, one full-time faculty person, which is Ms. Terry over here. We have one full-time professional, and then we have a part-time student worker. Um, in our office, we are in charge of formatting, approval, and preservation of theses and dissertations. We do offer an average of 10 um, workshops per semester. Um, those vary between face-to-face -face and online workshops. We also do one-on-one -on -one consults, and we can also do departmental workshops as requested. So our submissions for fall 2020 were kind of low. We only had 47 dissertations with 36 theses. We kind of figured that this was because of COVID and that was hindering a lot of research um, productivity. So we do expect to see our numbers to continue to increase as um, the pandemic eases out. So talking about actually getting into our accessibility standards that we set for um, our university. So like a lot of things, um, we were told just to make it work. Um, had a meeting, they said, this is what we need to do. We need to move forward with this. Um, we're gonna let you decide how to do it. So we did have one guideline that the university um, did wanna match the AA level of WCAG 2.0 standards. So that at least gave us a starting off point. So our first step was we had a training session with um, our campus information technology services. They actually began offering accessibility um, training workshops about the same time that we got that directive. So we attended one of their workshops and we this is where we learned about accessibility checkers, both in Word and PDF. Um, it's where we learned about alt text for um, images what a defined header was for our tables and um, some implications of using inline images. Once we kind of absorbed that information, um, we are very fortunate that we have an office that's dedicated to um, helping people with um, blindness or low vision. So we met with a specialist from the National Research and Training Center on blindness and low vision. Um, they are actually the nation's only federally funded center focused on employment outcomes for people who are blind or have low vision. And um, they produce field leading research and provide training to professionals ranging from direct service practitioners to administrators of state ag agencies and federal programs. So like I said, we're very glad to have them. These people are absolute experts. So we had a meeting with one of their specialists and um, she was very sure to make sure that we understood the importance of using styles and headers, which was something we were already doing in our templates. So that was something we didn't have to worry about. Um, but the biggest thing that we didn't really think about was avoiding blank space lines and um, simplifying tables. 
So when you're using the technology to read the screen, if you have a blank space in there, it's going to say blank line or it's going to say line or paragraph that kind of varies from technology to technology. So that was something we hadn't even thought of before. Um, we also spoke with legal counsel. Um, there were some things that we weren't sure exactly which way we needed to go. Um, information is very conflicting when it comes to ADA web accessibility. Um, even at the government level sites, some will say do this, some will say do that. So to make sure that all of our bases were covered, we did consult legal counsel on those issues to make sure that we were providing the most accessible documents possible. So once we had all of those discussions with all of those people across campus, um, we were a little overloaded with information. It took us a little while to digest that information and process it down to what we needed it to do. Um, so our next step was we started looking at other colleges and universities. What were they doing? How were they handling the situation? And there were three main ones that we um, decided to benchmark our processes against. And that was Penn State, California State, San Marcos, and Michigan State University. When we looked at all of their information and their um, documents that they provided to students and the help that they provided to students, we decided that they would be the easiest to implement. Um, and when I say easy to implement, it doesn't mean that their standards were lax. They had very high standards for what they wanted to achieve with ADA accessibility but it was easier to implement in that our students and faculty were going to be more willing to accept these changes in the future. So next we're going to talk about our student requirements. So what do we require of our students in um, regards to ADA web accessibility? We're going to talk about some of the changes we made to our templates and then our responsibilities. So some of the things that we have to handle in the office. Um, so that would be PDF conversion and an accessibility check. Um, did you skip a couple slides? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the first thing I guess we're going to talk about is um, updated that this page wasn't what I was expecting. Um, are we going to come back to that? No, I went back to the. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we skipped a slide. Sorry. Technical difficulties <laughs> of the day. Um, so let's talk about student requirements. So the main ADA accessible areas that we harp in on are our tables, our color contrast, um, alternative text with our images, and then our equations. Those are the things that we see most often um, our students using. So that's what we um, created standards for. So when we were developing these standards, we needed something that was going to meet requirements, but something that wasn't so difficult or so time consuming that our students were going to complain because when they complain, they complain to faculty and then our faculty come back and complain to us. So we had to find a nice um, middle ground of accessibility and not overloading the student with um, changes. So our first step was looking at tables. We knew from our meetings that this was going to be one of our easier tasks that we could adapt around. Um, so in our templates, we have a situation where um, our tables populate. And so we adjusted the template tools to make the process a little bit easier for our students when it comes to titles and um, uh, making sure that they're centered on the page um, and making sure that we have what's called a header row on that very initial table. Um, this is the top row of the column with the, the titles and descriptions where they're found. So if a table crosses over um, a page, we were already requiring that that table be split. We have to re-add those, um, or the, our students have to re-add those header rows. And what this does is it allows the user who's using a, scre a screen reader, they can go back and check those header rows if they get lost in where they're and where they're at, what the information is telling them. And they don't have to go all the way back to the very beginning of the table at the previous page. It's already there on that page. The biggest issue that we had to navigate through was merge cells. So merge cells for a reader, it can cause issues um, in the way that it processes. OK, I've read this cell. Now I need to move to this cell. Um, so the ideal thing is to remove all merge cells. We had to discuss a lot with various departments on campus um, and we found out that 
a lot of journals require a merge cell to show data in a very specific way. So we couldn't ask students to completely change their data cell, their table, their data in their tables just to be accessible for us because that would be a complete rework and that would be a lot of work for them. So what we decided to do is that we have a good faith effort statement on our web page that allows anybody who may need um, any additional help. If you need help, send us a form and we'll go through and we'll make sure that this document is even more accessible. Um, our next thing that we uh, had to set a standard around was color contrast. So color contrast, we don't set anything where we have very specific color codes that you have to use. Um, instead, we provide examples of this is a good contrast, this is a poor contrast. Um, our underlining guide here is we convert the image to black and white. If you can tell the difference in the colors in black and white, your contrast is good. If you don't, you need to go back and reconsider your color choices. Again, we have some students that their research uses um, electromagnetic imaging and all sorts of things, and there, there's no way to adjust that contrast. That's what the machine is set up to do. So again, we have that um, good faith effort statement to kind of um, combat that issue as well. So uh, our next thing was alternative text for our images. Um, this was very difficult because you could write a paragraph about what your image is about and the goal is to make it as simple as possible. So not only were we facing that, um, but we were also facing student backlash about it. Um, they didn't fully understand why they needed to do this process again because it's described in their thesis or the dissertation. Why did they need to do it again? So our compromise was we had a, a two sentence maximum you know, just give a brief description. And then after that, we say, we know that you've discussed this further in detail. So put the page number where you discuss this in detail. And then that way the reader knows, hey, I can go back and look at this page and I can get more information about this image. The last thing was equations. Um, equations were tricky because um, some readers will naturally read um, the, all, the math languages that are built into Word. Some of them won't. Um, and the ones that do, it doesn't guarantee that they read all of them. And it, there's just a bunch of variation between readers. Nothing is standardized. So we, we're having to work around a non-standard legal requirement, um, which it can be very difficult. So we tried a couple of different things for our equations. Um, originally, we had a um, we had a uh, a control box where our equation was placed, and then it gave a number. Um, so all of our numbers are or all of our equations are numbered. Um, but at that point, we're relying on the screen reader to read those that math language. So we thought about replacing just the text with an image. Well, to get the image replaced and put it on there, it causes formatting issues across the page. It moves the number. They're having to add alternative text. Um, that was a lot of steps that our students weren't willing to deal with. So then we thought about an invisible table with an image that removed um, the problem of formatting across the page, making the image too large. Um, but it came with its own set of problems because then, especially in very long proofs, um, it was causing problems with our formatting requirements for the numbers. So our final solution was to keep the invisible table and they would just copy and paste their equation just as they normally did um, into that table. But then you have to add alternative text to that table. So again, like all of their images and their data, they've discussed this in detail throughout their document. So we have a boilerplate statement for our equations. Um, for our students to use and all they have to do is populate the page number um, and it base it's basically this equation is discussed further on this page if you have any questions you can contact the author and we do have um, a request form set up if somebody needs to contact an author we can go through channels and try to make that work um so next i think miss terry is going to take over 
There we go. Okay. All right. So um, as Lara said, once we identified our standards, um, we started to update all of our materials. So we started with our templates, um, made sure that our new form for equations was was entered in there, um, added information concerning the tables and images so that students knew what they were supposed to do throughout the process. Uh, we also updated our workshops to uh, make sure we spent plenty of time going over um, how to add alternative text, what they needed to do with tables and equations, um, checking for color contrast and things like that. And we make sure we had plenty of time built into the workshops to answer those specific questions. Um, we knew that because our, our workshops are generally about an hour um, to an hour and a half, that that's a lot of information for the students to get at one period of time. So we then created a web accessibility handout that we could give students um, when they come to a workshop. Uh, we have it in a printed and a PDF format. So depending upon if they're in a in-person or a virtual workshop, they have the ability to get that information in these handouts provide step-by-step -step instructions for how to add accessibility to their documents. Um, and they include screenshots, um, both in words so that the students know exactly what they're looking for. Um, we had also created instructional videos. Um, so we had a few already, but we went ahead and expanded these. Um, so now there are specific ones um, for web accessibility that we make available for students. Um, so that they can, again, walk through step by step and show them exactly what they're needing to do. So um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about what our responsibility is for each of the documents once we receive them and what we do with the formatting checks, um, PDF conversion, and then the accessibility checks um, in PDF. So because our templates already use styles, um, uh, doc document navigation was something that already existed for us. Um, so we just continue to make sure that students connect everything to proper subheadings um, so that it shows up in the navigation for the document. And so when you click on a specific section in the navigation or in our table of contents, it'll take you to that point in the document. And then that when we convert it to a PDF, that navigation stays with the document. Um, for tables, um, as Lara mentioned, we made sure that um, any portion of the table, um, whatever page it's on, if it's a longer table that splits multiple pages, that the header row information is properly checked for each of those pages. Because you do have the ability to just go in and randomly check any row as a header row. So we do have to make sure that those are properly labeled. Um, we also go in and look at color contrast, as she said. So here's an example of um, on the top row, what looks like decent color um, variations on both sides. But as you can see, once you move it to grayscale, um, the, the top right one, it becomes too similar um, when it's changed to grayscale. So nobody, if you have any type of color blindness, you're not going to be able to see um, the exact variations as well as you can with the tables on the left. We also go through and individually check each of the documents um, for their the alternative text that's added to their images, equations, and schemes. Um, this does take us a little bit more time because um, we do have to make sure that students have included uh, page numbers on each of these, that the statements are correct, I and mean, that their alternative text for their images does not match what's exactly in their uh, figure table or, or captioning. So when we convert um, the document for the students, we, we do this for students. It's not something that we allow them to do. We do this for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that our university does not provide Adobe Pro for students. Um, and so we can't expect our distance students to be able to access this. While it's on our computers here on campus, if you're a distance student, you don't have access to it. So that's an, an unfair advantage if you're a distance student. Um, and also, it just creates a much more efficient review. Um, we can go through and know that everything is converted properly um, and check the accessibility because um, we would have to do that anyway after we receive the final PDF from the student. Um, so we just found that it was much easier for our office to do that last step. We then use the PDF um, accessibility checker. Um, the main errors that we normally find are concerning tab order and um, sometimes with image conversion. Um, so as you can see, here are some summaries of different errors that we found. Um, 
we all hope to to get a document that says that you know that the checker found no problems um, but usually what we see is with the tab order and that's a very easy fix um, under page properties in pdf so long as you have adobe pro um, but sometimes we have issues with images so let's say there's an image um, that's made up of multiple parts or the student used a specific program to create it and so their graph is each line is it's technically its own image that while the word accessibility checker did not have any problems with it when it was converted to a PDF, each of those little parts can become a problem. And so then we would have to send the document back to the student and we would request them to usually just take a screenshot of the image and then reinsert that into their document. That way each little part of the image is being read as a whole as opposed to multiple parts. So some of the issues we run into, as Lara mentioned earlier, is with screen readers um, because uh, each screen reader technology is different. Um, there is there's just there's no standard with it. Um, so usually screen readers can um, be a browser plugin or its own standalone software, and each of them do their own thing. So sometimes math languages work and sometimes they don't sometimes they can read right through equations or they skip over them all together and so again this is really just a best faith faith effort on our part to do everything we can um, to provide accessibility for these documents um, another issue we have is with latex documents um, currently we do not know how to make them accessible um, as you can see in this example here a student tried to add navigation to his document and it did not work and so that is it's not something that we could use so we asked him to remove that code from his document um, and it, we are currently working with faculty across campus to see what kind of codes we can add to our latex template uh, to make that happen but as of right now we don't have that capability And so what's next for us? Um, as I said, we're going to continue to work with campus faculty um, and see what we can do to create accessibility for LaTeX. Um, we're going to continue to mo monitor um, government accessibility standards and publishing standards in hopes that the two can finally meet. Um, hope that there's more clarification from the government as to how things can be done um, and hopefully publishing standards as more and more publishing companies move towards accessibility standards of their own since a lot of their documents and their journals are now online um, they're going to have to start adding web accessibility as well and so we know things like tables with merged cells and color contrast are going to become more and more of an issue for them as well so we're just going to continue to monitor all of that Thank you for contacting All right. Me. So that is the end of our presentation. Oh, hey, Justin. We should um, have time for yeah. questions. Figure out where to log online to make an appointment. Great. Thank you so much. And oh, we do have me? questions Let's flooding see. into uh, the <laughs> Q&A. Um, so some of them may repeat some Hello? information you already uh, you talked about. Um, Jonah asks, for images, do you require a descriptive caption in addition mm -hmm. to the alt text? Um, says, I believe you said there is description in the text. Okay, so um, I'm going to pull up a sample okay. document real quick um, and navigate to one of our figures. All right, so this is just an example. So we do have the image and then we have a figure title and if they want a note below it, which we do require, um, because whatever is listed as the title actually shows up in our list of figures. Um, but then whatever they list for their alternative text um, would need to be different from this, as well as provide the page number where they actually discuss the image further in the document. Thank you for calling St. John's University Services. Um, so I have a question. I, um, I saw on the uh, document that you just had up, um, you know the figure number oh, okay, and the title of the figure mm -hmm. um is it a requirement or a common practice to put the caption if you will a yes all of our figures have to have the those captions um because that's what when we the document creates the navigation for it to appear um 
Um, six and zero are, nine. Like in the list of figures uh, up here, it links to that title. One six um, eight. And five. so that's how. So, like, if I were to to use Control, um, yeah, how click on it online. Um, that takes me to there to that spot in the document. And so the captioning has to be there for all tables and figures, so that we can navigate through the document. Okay, um, I guess you know, um, for something that is possibly uh, more you know scientific, like in pharmacy yeah. or something like that, yeah. mm -hmm. um, well, we I'm often see you know expansive descriptions you know right. as part of the of the label um and, and we to, to some extent if like the student has like a, a note like this that is okay. i guess it like just what you're describing as a caption yeah. if it's rather extensive yeah. we can ask them to condense that some and make that the alternative text okay um, and then they would probably refer to that exact same page and say that it's the detailed description is in the captioning okay um, the next question from GW, um, can you apply alt text to a non-image formula? Yep. Okay, hold on. A non-image formula. Uh, no. So if you just type out the equation, you're that dependent on the um, screen reader to actually read it that math fun. language. Um, alternative text can only be applied to images and tables. I'm Everything else, Firefox. Um, there's no way to apply it. So here, here's kind of a, a sample of, of how we have equations in our document. So you can kind yeah. of see this table outline around the equation. So our for our standards, our equations are always centered on the page and the, yep. the number um, however, it's numbered is going to be right aligned. Um, and so students can just copy and paste their equations into these tables, and then they can go into the table properties and add alternative text here. It, you know, it did work. GW, does that answer your question? <laughs> did that answer it? <laughs> Support IT um, you can either type or okay. um, I know, think I've got it. Uh, turn on so your, your help. video if you need more clarification. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, I don't see a response, so I'll just keep going. Um, I had a question myself, but it was about latex, so. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So moving on, um, I also had a second question, and that was: um, Are open source PDF mm -hmm. converters adequate for accessibility? Since you mentioned, you know, students do not have access to um, Adobe Pro, and I think that's pretty common across universities. Mm -hmm. We haven't done a lot of research into those. Um, the ones that we did look at seem. When we were trying to find one, the ones that we found, they would allow you to to convert so many documents before it became a paid for version. And we didn't want to have students pay for something. Um, yeah. And so since since we know we have access to Adobe Pro from the university, it's just it's been easier for us to make that conversion so that we can do those final checks in in the PDF document. The, the reason why you have to have the Pro is for adjusting the accessibility for making to fixing any issues that the PDF um, might pick up in their accessibility. You can't do that in the open source or the unpaid versions as of our last research. Now, somebody might have said, you know, I see that this is moving forward. We need to be able to offer this. But as of now, we haven't been able to find anything. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on, Deborah asks, what do you do if a student is unable to meet your accessibility standards? We haven't run into that issue. Um, we started this spring 2020, which is a wonderful semester to start anything new. Um, and, and so we have had students who have had trouble understanding, but we're able to set up like a one-on-one -on -one consultation with them, either in person or virtually, and explain what's needed, and they've been able to take care of their requirements. Okay. Um, Stephanie asks, what's the average amount of time it takes for you to review for accessibility and convert the document to the PDF? 
at the, the longer we do it, the less time it takes. Um, usually, I would say it adds about 15 to 20 minutes per document, um, which but that's a that would be a very heavy image intensive document. Right. Um, you could probably do it from start to finish the way that we traditionally um, formatted documents. You could probably do it in 10 minutes and that's you fixing some of the harder things in Adobe. So it's not terrible. It's just a couple of extra things to check. And, and, and we, we normally only deal with about 120 students per semester. And so I, I don't know what other institutions, what your, your load is like. So it could be for us that is manageable, but for another institution who may have more submissions that might not be. Yeah. Or who have like only one staff person or yes. a half time <laughs> staff person yeah. Yeah. doing that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's nice when you have someone you can split the load with. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so the next question says, um, so are you not letting students use the auto numbering feature for equations? The, so how our templates are set up, we are using the auto numbering feature. It's just, um, it's a, a more complicated way of getting it done. <laughs> um, especially when we get into uh, some of our more technical uh, templates where you've got your chapter number and then the number of the equation in that chapter um, where we are using that. It's just a backwards way of getting it to work the way we need it to work. And that's just how we have our, um, how we have everything set up. So for our equations, our tables and our figures, we have it set up to where they just type in a, a little phrase and hit F3 and it does everything for them. And all they have to do is just populate their information. Um, so it does do that for them. We just have a, a, a little bit of a complicated way of getting it done because we offer those other benefits along with the shortcut. Yeah, our, our templates in our templates, because they're automated, we created quick parts for students to easily be able to add those things. Um, so it's it's more work for us to keep the templates up to date, but then the students are able to, to automatically create things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so the um, last question we have is, um, you might have already kind of answered it, but for clarification, you actually fix, do you actually fix the accessibility issues in the PDF, or do you instruct the student how to do it in their Word document? Because most of the issues we come across are tag order um, or, or tab order, it's something you can only fix with Adobe Pro. We do make those corrections. But if we come across an instance where there's missing alternative text or it's something that needs student input because it's content related, we will send it back to the student to have them correct it. Okay, um, so I don't see any more questions, and um, we have about seven, six or seven minutes left. So, um, do you either of you have any uh, sort of maybe tips for you know uh, creating this type of program at our own institutions or pitfalls? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's going to be complicated. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie to you about that. It's going to be complicated. And the more universities you look at, the more government sites that you look at, the worse it's going to be. So find a few that their standards, their traditional standards kind of look similar to your own universities or your own colleges and look at what they've done with their accessibility and see if you can mimic that fairly easy. Um because it's, it, there's a lot of information and a lot of it's conflicting and a lot of it doesn't apply to everything, if that makes sense. Um, even in Word and Adobe, when we do the accessibility checks, I can run it on my computer and I will get a set of errors. Ms. Terry can run it on her computer and she's gonna get a completely different set of errors sometimes. So it's, it, that's how, insane it really is. Um, so you just kind of have to set your bar at this is what we're willing to accept. Have a good faith effort statement on your repository 
and you know have a form if anybody needs to request they can request it um but yeah you've got to set your own bar and you've got to say this is where we draw the line because it it can take up a lot of your time very very quickly especially when you get into the checking the document side of it um because like you said some people only have one person and you've got to do 200 documents it can it can very well very much take over your life very quickly if you don't set that bar thank you um we did have a couple more um questions um uh, Lily asked if we can have a link to your handout, but I believe the handouts are going to be available in the conference proceedings and all of our sessions are being recorded, um, so they will be accessible um, as well. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Lily. Um, we, we think that, that uh, if I remember correctly, that handout is also available on the website, mm -hmm. on our website, so he can download it from there as well. Or okay. you could email us and we're, yeah. we're happy to, yeah. to share information. Yes. yes. Okay. Because that's like the only it. way we made through it was <laughs> looking at other people's things. Yeah. Oh, oh, Lily actually meant your accessibility standard that you give to your students. Mm -hmm. she, she could email us and we would be happy to share that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and in the last four minutes, we have another question. Was it harder figuring out the word templates or learning how to read slash use the Adobe Pro accessibility tools? For me, it was Adobe Pro. <laughs> uh, well, it depends on what she means by the templates. Uh, creating the templates is took more time for me. Um, but the accessibility part of it in uh, in Word is is pretty user friendly. Um, it's it's a button and it pops up for you and it'll walk you through it. Adobe's a little trickier, so. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, uh, that's all the questions that I see in the chat. Um, unless anybody has any follow up. Um, or, you know, any uh, parting words of encouragement. <laughs> um, we're all open to that. Um, and I just want to thank you both for this amazing information um, and for, you know, taking one for the whole team and <laughs> charging <laughs> forward into, into this fray. Um, I, I think we're all very conscious of, you know, increasing accessibility standards and that has a lot of legal, you know, implications. So, you know, treading into kind of some unknown waters, it's 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 comforting in a way to find out that, you know, some of the stuff you have to learn on your own, you know, or, yeah. be, the one, or be the one to to take charge. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Well, if anybody has any questions moving forward, if you have any worries about any of it, you can feel free to email us and we can walk you through what our thought processes were and instead of recreating the wheel for everybody um, y'all are more than welcome to do that all right um, well um, I think this leaves us a couple extra minutes for you know the next break or the next I think the next session actually in two minutes is going to be the um, uh, poster presentation. Yeah, and I'm so, going to go moderate that. So. There you go. All right. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you, everyone.